It's always fun to be the guinea pig. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's an honor to be here. And uh, this is uh, my responsibility, I guess, to kick this off. And I do want to tell you a little bit about what my goals are in this first talk. So we're, I think my responsibility here is to convince you, uh, if you're not already convinced, that there's a biological plausibility to these interventions that uh, Sufi so well characterized, that uh, we should not be applying things willy-nilly, but rather think about the biology that's behind brain development, the fact that behaviors that we're interested in uh, emanate from the brain, and that the brain has a very, just like the growth curves that were described, has a very well-described way of developing. I would be remiss if I didn't say that this talk is actually put together by several people, uh, Sarah Cusick, uh, Bruce McEwen, who helped with the stress section, and Ted Wax, who helped author the psychological section. I'm going to divide the talk actually into two halves. The first half is we're going to call rules of engagement. So these are the rules that I think need to be applied in order to assess what brain development is doing and the impact of environmental factors, whether it's nutrition, whether it's stress, whether it's environmental enrichment on that developing brain. And the reason to do that is so that we're not essentially waving our hands, but instead know that there is a stimulus response here, that if we do an intervention, that there will be a change in the brain in respective area, in, per, in particular areas, and then one can expect changes in behavior based on those changes in the brain. Uh, and there's a pretty rich biology, both in preclinical studies and now emerging evidence in human studies, to say that this is, this is a real phenomenon. Um, and then in the second half of the talk, we'll quickly go through each of these major areas, nutrition, stress, and, uh, and environmental enrichment, to see what the evidence is in terms of uh, uh, better outcomes. So if I leave you with nothing else, um, I would like you to realize that the positive or negative effects of any environmental stimulus or any environmental effect on brain development is really based on two things. And it was really captured by these very smart people here. And that is that it's going to be based on the timing and the dose and duration. So those are two things. Think about dose and duration as kind of an area under the curve. It's the magnitude of effect, both in terms of severity and duration. And environment in our context could mean nutrition, it could mean stress, it could mean nurturing events, or some combination of the three. And one of the challenges will be to ask the question whether interventions in any of these overlap the opportunities uh, given from the other areas. And I'll explain that in a second. So the first thing is to disabuse you of the idea that the brain is an organ. It is actually multiple organs. To talk about the brain would be to say, uh, to, to talk about something like the thorax. There are many organs in the thorax, the heart, the lungs, and so on. They're all interconnected, but they all have their separate entities as well. That is true for the brain as well. The brain is not a homogeneous organ. It is made up of many different areas, different cell types. These different regions have different developmental trajectories. Many of the, them start their development uh, in fetal life. Uh, which has implications about maternal uh, intervention, and many of them continue throughout adolescence and even into early adulthood. The vulnerability of a brain region to any environmental insult is going to be based on a, two things. The timing of the deficit or enrichment programs during the lifespan. So we don't apply equal therapies throughout the pediatric lifespan. And the intersection between that and the brain's region uh, requirement for, for example, a nutrient, uh, or its vulnerability to stress, or its receptivity to enrichment at that time. And again, that varies across the lifespan, from fetal life, where the placenta essentially filters very much of, what of, of the external environment, through adolescent life, it seems, where you're very exposed. So the two really have to come together, and I'll give you a very palpable example. You are not likely throughout your life it's not, you're not as much at risk throughout your pediatric life, equally at risk, to be for iron deficiency. There are times when you're much more at risk for iron deficiency than other times, based on growth, based on transport, all sorts of reasons. 
Similarly, different brain regions have a higher or lower requirement of, for iron at different times in the lifespan. And so the vulnerability comes when you have high demand and you have lack of availability. Okay? So we're going to try and identify some of those and again, see how well these, over, these overlap. This is one of my favorite slides. If you want to capture all of human brain development in one slide, this, this is the one. And this is from my friend Chuck Nelson. We're very thankful that he published this back in 2001. Many of us in the field use this slide. It looks a little complicated, but I want to impress a couple things on you here. First of all, you will notice that the x-axis is very stretched here, right? Most of life actually occurs out here. This is where most of us are, right? And you can notice that there's not a lot of brain development taking place out there. Um, the fact of the matter is we do have experience-dependent plasticity out there. It's a good thing. That means we're going to learn something here today. But look, if we start in fetal life here before birth at time zero, um, we see that myelination, so speed of processing in the brain, synaptogenesis, connecting up your brain, learning and memory, hippocampus, are all well underway by the time the baby is born a term. That tells you a lot about maternal, fetal, uh, dyad uh, health. Um, the frontal cortex here already developing early in the early months. Now, we don't think of babies as multitasking particularly well, but in fact, that area of the brain is developing rapidly and will be vulnerable to either insults or receptive to uh, inter interaction. I've put a solid box around zero to three because, of course, that's what everybody thinks about. But you've noticed I've extended that with these more dotted boxes as we go out even into the teenage years. And that's to remind me to tell you not to forget that there are opportunities out here. It is bet the bottom line is it's better to have done it right in the first place, but there are opportunities because development continues not through just through the teenage years, but presumably through the lifespan. When we do large-scale studies, particularly in humans, there are many outcomes. Behavioral changes are uh, among them. We are trying to improve children's behavior, uh, largely writ. And these behave in, in, in the rules of engagement, these behavioral changes need to map onto the brain structures and circuits that are altered by environmental experience. That is, we can't just say poor environment here at the beginning of life, bad outcome here, gee, they must be connected. The question is, how does that environment get under the skin? How does that affect the brain? And what can we do to either enhance or interrupt a process? Um, that's important because sometimes you will come to very different conclusions about what the, inter, what the, what the uh, uh, intervention should be based if you know what the biology is. Some of the effects are transient of uh, certain deficits, for example, certain nutrient deficits. They alter brain function while you're deficited. And others are much more long-term. And that is an interesting problem in neuroscience. Is that because you built the brain wrong in the first place during that window of opportunity? Or is the brain dysregulated across the lifespan? And those are not mutually exclusive possibilities. The bottom line, again, is that there should be a biological plausibility for our behavioral outcomes our social outcomes and so on. There must be a reason why in the brain these things are happening. We talk about vulnerability and plasticity during rapid brain development. The early brain, the, the child from fetal life through the first few years, is very plastic. They are very recoverable brains, but they're also very vulnerable brains. And I think the NIH probably stated it best that on the whole, vulnerability outweighs plasticity. Another way of saying that is it's better to do it right in the first place than to try to get kids who are off trajectory to come back. Uh, there is a tremendously interesting literature on the biological basis for true critical periods. We argue about critical versus sensitive periods. We would like to think that no window is ever closed, but in certain biologies, indeed, there are critical periods where beyond that time point, nothing can be changed. So, this basic biology is important because it may be possible in the future to reopen critical periods, to reestablish plasticity in the brain. So that's a very exciting area right now. Early neurodevelopment is important immediately and later for two reasons. One, in those early years, what I showed you on, the, in, on that uh, slide, is primary systems are developing. These are the ones that support learning and memory, the ones that support speed of processing, 
and the ones that support reward. They are being shaped and sculpted early on. They are important in term for scaffolding for the next order of systems to come into place. Your frontal lobe for which you do the ones that really get you through school, working memory, prioritization, attention, inhibition, and those kinds of things. So it's important both early to do it right and then to continue beyond that. And I'll show you some evidence of that. The possibility that there are these differential sensitive periods, uh, it's possible these, these sensitive periods have different uh, time points in development. For example, many of us think that the nutritional effects uh, are early in brain development, that reduction of toxic stress is important throughout development, that environmental enrichment may have a little bit more effect later on. Um, these need defining over time. I would not turn any of this into policy at this point, but we need to see where the evidence lies for that. The primary question is, if our resources are limited, where, is, where times are the best times to intervene? Where are we, will we get an integrated biological and psychosocial intervention? So let me briefly run through each of the uh, things that are important in, an early, uh, in a child's early life. What I've listed here is nutrients that are particularly important for brain development early in life. And again, we're talking about fetal through, say, th three to five years of age. All nutrients are important for brain development, but there are certain ones that seem to have a particularly profound effect. Uh, and they include protein and long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids, iron, zinc, iodine, copper. These should be familiar to you. They are the ones that we look at throughout the world uh, and through many popula young populations. And here I've listed, and you can find these on, on the website, uh, the areas of the brain that are affected and the particularly high demand periods. And there are some clinical data that go along to suggest that there are sensitive periods for nutrient supplementation. For example, a recent publication that growth velocity prior to a year, but not afterwards, predicts IQ at nine years of age, that linear growth has a strong association with brain development. We used to think it was growth equals weight gain. Turns out linear growth may be a better surrogate for uh, actual structural development of the brain. Uh, similarly, fetal supplementation of iron and folic acid appears to improve working memory and inhibitory control at seven to nine years of age, but later supplementation doesn't seem to have as much of an effect. Uh, Bruce McEwen has spent most of his research life looking at stress and types of stress. Uh, you know, stress is not necessarily a bad thing. Stress actually sharpens your, your focus in many ways. A little bit of stress is probably good. Toxic stress is not, and that's what he, of course, studies. This is exacerbated by chaos and abuse and neglect, and uh, it, it results in a very unhealthy brain structure, and I want to show you what the effect is of toxic stress, chronic inflammation and so on, does to the hippocampus, the area that is really the seat of recognition memory. It truncates dendrites, it makes for smaller synapses, and over here, I've shown you exactly the same type of effect due to iron deficiency anemia. So it turns out that the end result of either of these toxic uh, uh, environmental effects is to shrink your dendrites, make for smaller dendrites, and less efficient uh, behavior. In fact, one of the questions we need to be asking throughout this conference is, what's the interaction between these various things? It turns out there is a two-way street between nutrients and stress. Stressed individuals do not absorb nutrients and traffic nutrients in the same way that a healthy non-stressed individual does. Similarly, malnutrition results in a poor or more blunted stress response. In terms of early enrichment, I think there are plenty of clinical studies that show that uh, early environmental intervention results in better outcomes. And I've listed some of them here. And six to 12 months is a sensitive period for promoting secure attachment that early, the early years of life are particularly salient for, improving qual, uh, for, for interventions to improve quality of parenting, and that interventions during the early uh, years uh, in both high and low income countries have long term cognitive and academic effects. But the point is you can't stop there. There are plenty of studies to show that when you end the therapy, things regress back to the mean. So follow up and follow on therapies are important 
both to stabilize and improve uh, what was done in the early years. And the process doesn't end at five years, and that was why that was that final dotted line out there. Adolescence is an unexplored area in many ways. There is a lot of brain change going on there as well. It is a chance for catch up, and it is a chance to solidify that scaffolding that we've done er with our early interventions. And we see that experience dependent brain development in adolescent mediates lots of very high end things that ultimately will decide economic and social status and improvement of society in general. So, uh, conclusions. Early development's important. You can't make it all back up just by intervening later. You want to scaffold the brain correctly in the first place for some fundamental things like learning and memory and speed of processing and then the neural scaffolding for the more higher end functions as they come along. These early events confer a lifetime of risk partly through epigenetic modification of genes, the early period is not the sole sensitive time, but it gets harder. It gets harder as you go along. Uh, so these follow-up and follow-on interventions are crucial, and integration across all of them are important because there is crosstalk between nutrition and stress, between stress and environmental, uh, environmental enrichment. So we need to think about how we channel those together to improve uh, the brain's development. So I will stop there, and we'll move on to our next talk. Thank you.